Today, folks, we have some massive news coming your way for Nintendo Switch 2. I can't believe we have some direct sources here from fellow content creators talking about the specs of what this system has. And you know what? Comparing it to a current generation system, not PlayStation 4 or Xbox. So this is going to be quite compelling stuff. We also have a friend of the channel giving us some happy news from third-party developers making games for Nintendo Switch 2. But we're not just stopping there. We have to talk about Unicorn Overlord today. And Ed Boon comes out to talk about the Switch version making some promises when it comes to Mortal Kombat 1. All right, guys. Well, before we get into that, I just want to remind you guys that we are on a road to 150,000 subscribers. So I would appreciate if you would go ahead and smash that validation button, subscribe to the channel, and ring-a-ling that ding-a-ling to be notified of all future uploads, including the Nintendo Prime podcast tonight at 8 p.m. Central. You guys are going to want to be there. We have lots of Switch 2 stuff to talk about. <laughs> Our first story today deals with Unicorn Overlord, the biggest, well, one of the biggest surprises from the last Nintendo Direct. Now, today we got a PR email giving some exact details on this game. I wanted to go over this because, again, we don't really know a lot about Unicorn Overlord, including its very strange name. So let's get into it. First, it starts with the story portion, and it says, The story takes place on the continent of Fevrith, a land home to five nations, Cornea, Drakenhold, Elheim, Bestorius, and Abion, inhabited not only by humans, but also by other races, such as elves, angels, and a race of beast folk known as Bestrals. After Cornea's general Valmor rebels against his nation's royal family, he starts a war that will soon tear the entire continent apart. Elaine, the protagonist of the game, and Prince Cornea flees from his home during the uprising and is chosen to lead the Liberation Army that will free all subjugated lands from Fevrith. Ten years have passed, and with the legendary Ring of the Unicorn in hand, Elaine raises the flag of rebellion to lead his people to freedom. The characters for the protagonist, we got Elaine, who is the crown prince of the fallen kingdom of Cornea and son of its queen, Elania. After losing his mother at a young age at Miss Cornean, General Valmore's rebellion, he was ushered to the island of Palvia by the knight Joseph, who taught him sword and strategy alike until the age of 17. The protagonist's ally is named Scarlet, who is a priestess of the Palvian Orthodoxy, who, after training tirelessly from a young age, now tends to the cathedral on the island of Palvia. In the end, she opts to leave the island and join Elaine on his journey. Now, an ally to the protagonist is Lex, a childhood friend of Elaine's, born on the island of Palvia to a local fisherman. After studying under Joseph, he resolves to join the quest to liberate Fevrith. Uh, another ally is Joseph himself, a holy knight of the fallen kingdom of Cornea. He fled to Palvia with Elaine ten years ago at Elenia's behest. He made his great strides toward forming the Liberation Army ever since. Now, the protagonist's mother, Elenia, is the queen of Cornea, who ruled with both a keen military mind and a steady hand. Upon realizing there was no quelling the tide of the rebellion, she entrusted her son, Elaine, and her loyal retainer, Joseph. Now, the enemy, the protagonist's main enemy, is Galerius, emperor of the reborn Zenorian Empire, and once a renowned Cornean general by the name of Valmor. After leading a successful rebellion against the Cornean royal family, he claimed all of Fevereth as his own. Now, we got a little breakdown of the gameplay. You can freely transverse an expansive world, gather new allies by forging bonds. There's over 60 unique characters in the game. Characters include humans and elves and massive beasts and heavenly angels. You can reclaim towns and rebuild them with materials that you've gathered, and you can also train your allies. Now, some of the systems in the game include defeating Zornian forces, to control towns and fortresses to restore law and order, gain access to facilities such as armorers and provisioners, wandering enemies disappear after you restore law and order, battles include real-time combat, and victory is secured once you clear certain conditions. Individual battles begin when your units make contact with the enemy during a battle stage, and you can coordinate a unit's tactics with conditions that factor how and when skills will automatically be used. Now, there are difficulty levels 
Three of them, to be exact. Sweet is a difficulty focusing on story, and those are for players looking to win battles without too much difficulty. Normal is the difficulty focusing on tactical gameplay, for players who may be unfamiliar with strategy games. And hard, a difficulty focusing on pushing your tactical mind to its limits, for players who are quite skilled at strategy games. Now, there is an online mode that takes place in a coliseum and enjoys PvP battles. So, look guys, this Unicorn Overlord game looks utterly fantastic, and the Unicorn Ring, I'm <laughs> betting, plays a major role in this whole thing and in the title of the game itself so guys i'm really excited for this this is one of my most anticipated games coming out for switch so hey i'm looking forward to the next information drop next up we have to dive right into nintendo switch 2 because look the rumors are swirling all over and we have a fresh batch of rumors today that include performance metrics and exact specifications and this comes from the form of a fellow youtuber called red gaming tech. Now, I don't know a ton about this YouTuber. I had never heard of him before. He was being referenced over at WCCF Tech in an article. That's how I found him. But I want to give credit to the original source. So let's dive into the stuff that he is claiming he has heard from his own sources. So, he heard that the system will indeed have 12 gigabytes of RAM, matching the prior rumors and reports. The RAM itself will have 128-bit bus width. Look, that means a whole lot. Some people thought it might be 64. 128 is a good thing. It's rocking an 8X Cortex A78 CPU cores. This is essentially what everyone was assuming the T239 was rocking anyway, so that kind of falls in line with a lot of the heavy speculation around the chip in the system. It does have a 12X SM, which is based on NVIDIA's Ampere architecture. However, the interesting thing is he's claiming that he has heard it does have some Lovelace features even though it's not the Lovelace architecture. I'm not sure what that means exactly. One of his sources says the clocks are 6,400 megahertz docked and 4,800 megahertz handheld, but then he had another source that claimed 4,267 megahertz, but he doesn't know if that source was claiming that is docked or handheld. Now, storage is apparently 256 to 512 gigabytes of eMMC, but he's unsure if that's two different models or the size was undecided or there's just different sizes in different dev kits. Beyond that, he does say DLSS support is true, but I'm not gonna go into deep details on this. Look guys, we have much more credible information out there on DLSS at this point, thanks to leaks we had out of Gamescom. Now maybe the biggest piece of info here is about the performance of the system, and then it comes within 10 to 20, so roughly 15%, of the Xbox Series S likely well docked. I'm just, I'm just quoting him. Now that's very close to the Asus ROG Ally in non-docked mode, which by the way, that's like an $800 system, so that still is pretty good. Now he does think that this was with DLSS enabled, but he wasn't sure and no one actually told him, so he's just making an assumption. I don't know, like I think, you know, when you're within 10 to 15% of, you know, the Xbox Series S, and then I've been told behind the scenes personally that it's much closer to the PlayStation 4 Pro in power, while the PlayStation 4 Pro and the Xbox Series S trade blows in different ways. So I don't actually think it's too far-fetched to think that this is actually the base performance, not with DLSS, but you know what? I don't actually know. Nobody really does, because no one's, talking about that. Now, a big feature he did here is that the system is backwards compatible. That is music to some of you guys' ears, but he does note that he doesn't want this to feel like it's a confirmation since there's other reports out there that maybe it's not backwards compatible. Does that mean he's shaky on his sources? I don't know. I'm just sharing the information. We'll have a full link to his video down below. But that's not where things stop today. The Paul Gale Network stopped by our live stream last night to drop a little nugget he's heard from his third-party connections. And look, Paul Gale Network is heavily connected. He's been in the video game industry as a journalist for decades. And he he's a school teacher now. He does a lot of amazing stuff. He's got so many connections. I... I Honestly, it makes me a little jealous sometimes, but here's the thing. He dropped a little nugget on my live stream, but then he took that nugget and ended up putting it out on Twitter for the entire world. So even though I heard about it first from him, as did people at the live stream, now the whole world knows. And let's check this out because it's really exciting for Nintendo Switch too. So Paul Gale Network says, a friend that works at a third party, so this is a third party studio, told me the difference in the dev kit excitement slash working on Nintendo's next system is night and day to how they approach the Nintendo Switch. Now, he says there is nothing else beyond that, but he, he wants to put some hypotheses out there. After all, these are his friends. He would know them better than us. And he goes, hypothesizing on my part, but this is also likely true for multiple studios. 
where Wii U left some companies less than optimistic on how well Nintendo NX, Nintendo Switch, would perform, and as a result, not everyone had titles ready immediately and had to port later. Nintendo has built such a high-quality ecosystem with Nintendo Switch that whatever its successor is, is being highly welcomed. Good third-party faith in Nintendo's next platform is great to hear. Nintendo's software output per generation never misses. They always deliver. Okay, it's a little... Some people might argue that's not always true, but anyways, managing tight relationships and satisfying indies and third parties, including said folks enjoying their sales, more moving parts. I am very much looking forward to when Nintendo eventually reveals their next console, and I think we're in for a major treat. And you know what? I tend to agree with his conclusion there. It's just nice to hear from more people that third-party companies are just stupidly excited about this platform and ready to start making games and releasing games and excited for fans to receive the games that they're working on. So again, just more and more and more good news. Pretty much everything we've heard about Nintendo Switch 2 has been nothing but amazingly great news. The only questionable thing was like, hey, if it doesn't have backwards compatibility, that's not great. But everything else we've heard about this thing is like, Damn, this is exactly what we wanted Nintendo to do. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. I don't know what next is going to come out about Nintendo Switch 2 because the floodgates have open. Now we get to a different type of Nintendo Switch 2 leak. This one coming from a somewhat known leaker online in Nash Weedle over on Twitter or X or did he zeet? I have no idea, but let's get to his tweet. So he basically says, and it's in a different language, that Yakuza and Like a Dragon collection is coming to Nintendo Switch 2 at launch. He doesn't go into which games will be part of the collection. And I do believe there's roughly six of them, maybe five. I, have, I think it's like one of them is called Zero and then One, Two, and then there's like four, five, six. I, well, I don't really understand the Yakuza series. I haven't played it. Anyways, when we think about the collection, maybe it's just like the first three games. I think that's what they did when they brought the games over to Xbox, because these were originally PlayStation exclusive IP. Then I think they brought the first three in a collection to Xbox, and then they brought four, five, six. Maybe that's what's happening now. Maybe it's all six games in one mega collection for 60 or 70 bucks. I don't really know. All I know is, hey, if we can get the Yakuza franchise, which does regularly score in the mid 80s on Metacritic, that to me means we're just getting a quality franchise, maybe day one on Nintendo Switch 2. I mean, Nash Weedle straight up says, these are this is a launch collection pack for Switch 2. So, hey, you know what? The more the merrier, baby. Give me all the high quality third party games on this next platform. Now our final story today deals with Mortal Kombat 1 and I'm kind of rolling my eyes because look it didn't review very well on Switch. It's one of the worst reviewed games on Switch actually. Lots of disappointment around this because Mortal Kombat 11 ran pretty well and had really solid reviews so people had high hopes for Mortal Kombat 1 and the Switch version is apparently hot trash. Again I'm not speaking from personal experience but I, we've all seen the videos. We've all seen the screenshots. Some things are a little bit misrepresented and not being called bugs that are really bugs. But either way, a bug is still a problem. So look, guys, let's just dive into what Ed Boon said in an interview in response to all of this. Because, yeah, we obviously don't want it to stay in this state, do we? So in an interview with BBC Newsbeat, Mortal Kombat series creator Ed Boon said this about the Switch version of the game. And a number of the concerns of the issues that have come up will absolutely be addressed. It would have been ideal for us to have released the version we absolutely wanted. But anything that we're finding a problem with is on our list and it's going to be fixed. And he did later go on to note and clarify that anything his team finds to be unacceptable in this version are going to be addressed for Mortal Kombat 1. Now what I find really interested about this is following this up in the future. I'm actually curious that they, you know, this is just one of those right things to say in the moment, but nothing actually happens. If you guys remember, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet had a number of glitches and performance problems, and Nintendo came out to say, hey, we're aware of these problems, it's unacceptable, and we're gonna work to work on a way to fix them. And then, lo and behold, here we are a year, almost a year later, and Scarlet and Violet is not only getting DLC, they still haven't patched and fixed all these performance problems. So, Again, it was the right thing for Nintendo to say at the time, which was last holiday season, 
but they never really addressed it. And I'm worried that this might be Ed Boon making promises because it's the right thing to say, but then because the sales aren't that great, they just don't even bother to really patch and release any updates to fix anything. Again, I, I'm maybe being a bit pessimistic here, but we have already examples where companies, including Nintendo themselves, have said things and then not actually done it. So I'm gonna keep updating this story as we go, and hopefully within a month or two, we have some good news patches for Mortal Kombat 1, and then we can give Ed Boon credit for sticking to his word, even though he fully admits, look guys, we should have just released a better version. And it seems, in hindsight, maybe the Switch version should have been delayed in this case for a better quality product. But look, they didn't port this directly to the studio that made Mortal Kombat 1. They hired the same studios that did Mortal Kombat 11's port, and I'm guessing they just trusted them because, hey, the Mortal Kombat 11 port was great, so why wouldn't they trust Saber Interactive and the rest? But apparently this time around, not so good. Also, there's reports out there that Saber Interactive might be done porting Switch games in general. Uh, it sounds like they might have a Switch 2 dev kit, so now they're focusing on porting Switch 2 games. So maybe they weren't giving their A-team effort here as they're looking for the next, you know, system. I don't know. This is just reports and rumors out there. I don't really know what's going on. I can only do my best to deliver the news to you. That being said, guys, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. I am Nathaniel RoboJets from Nintendo Prime. It's been an awesome episode today. Hopefully, I see each and every one of you guys at tonight's Nintendo Prime podcast live at 8 p.m. Central right here on YouTube. And you know what? If you're not there, I'll see you in the next video.